and welcome back to the Brilliant Writer Book Chat. Today we are talking about The Inner Game of Tennis by W. Timothy Galway. Makes you kind of wonder what the W is. Anyways, I read this book, eh, I don't know, a year or two before and reread it a few times and I remember that this book was one of those books where once you read it you're like, wow, that is so insightful. And then you promptly forget everything that you've learned. <laughs> so. It was due for a rereading, and that's the reason why I decided to make this little mini presentation about the inner game of tennis, what the book is about, and what are some of the most important lessons you can learn from it. So basically, um, Galway is a, a tennis instructor, and he learned something about teaching students that gave him insight into not only how the game of tennis can be played, but sports in general, and beyond that, life. So it's not, it's a tennis book that's not really about tennis in some sense. His main thesis, the main core of the book is that he says there's basically two psychological selves that every person deals with. There's self one and self two, he calls them that. Um, it's not like a physical different thing. It's a mental thing. So self one is kind of like what people who are post Freud would call the ego. It's the conscious self, it's the part who wants to control everything and tell tell you what to do. And self too is the more childlike, playful, instinctive, natural um, learner. So a good anecdote that he talked about in the story that illustrates the difference between these two selves is he said that he was teaching a lady how to play tennis. And no, no, there's two stories. I'll start with uh, the first one is the one about the lady who was trying to play tennis and she was terrible. She kept hitting the ball on the rim of her racket, which is actually something kind of rather difficult to do when you're not, um, you know, when you're trying to do that. Anyways, so he told her, you know, instead of trying to hit the ball, I want you to focus on watching the seams of the ball as it comes towards you and then just, you know, let your body do whatever it wants to do. And so she did. And she was focusing on the seams of the ball and she started to hit the ball with her racket smack in the center, which she'd never been able to do before. Actually, he first tried to make tell her, okay, try to hit the ball, number one. So she tried and then she failed. Then he said, now try to hit the ball with the edge of your racket the way that you've been doing. And when she tried to do that, it wasn't working very well either. And then he told her like, look at the seams of the ball. And then she was able to hit the ball. And the thing about that is he said, once you tell the conscious mind to focus on something like the seams of the ball, or maybe the sound that the ball makes when it hits the racket, or at exactly what point it hits the ground, or at exactly what point it hits either your racket or your opponent's racket, when your conscious self one brain is thinking about these things, it frees up the self two brain, the instinctive side of you, to do what it's supposed to do, which is actually hit the ball. And an even better example of this is he told the story of a man who came to him for help. And this man had been told that when he swung his racket, it was too high. And so he's like, I went to a bunch of different tennis instructors and they all tell me that my swing is too high, that I, I um, end up lifting the racket at the last moment and then kind of clipping the ball. And so Galloway was like, all right, let me see you hit a few balls. And he saw that, wow, this man really does end up lifting his racket at the wrong time and his swing is too high. And he realized though that just saying this to the man wouldn't do anything because the man obviously could articulate his problem, but he didn't really know how to fix it. So what he did was he had the man stand in front of a mirror and he's like, all right, I want you to swing just with a racket in front of this mirror. And as a man swung, he saw that his racket lifted at the end of the arc. And he was like, oh, I really am swinging too high. And Galway said, what surprised him was the man's surprise because the man had been articulating my swing is too high. My swing is too high. Everybody tells me that my swing goes up too, too far at the end of the, at the end of the swing but he didn't really get it apparently. He could talk about it, but he didn't understand it. And once he saw himself doing it, doing the wrong thing, then he was able to correct it because he was able to deliberately lower his hand or his arm and do the correct motion a few times. And then he understood how that felt in his body. And then later when they returned back onto the court and then Galway gave him a few balls to try to hit, he was able to do it correctly this time. And so I found that story particularly fascinating and really illustrative of what's the difference between self one and self two. It's like the conscious mind versus the, the actual mind. It's kind of like the difference between knowing and understanding, being able to articulate something and being able to do something. There was, I recently wrote an email where I was talking about the difference or what learning really is 
is when your behavior changes. If your behavior hasn't changed, you haven't learned. And that applies for everything. You know, when you learn a new mathematical principle, concept, your behavior changes in that now you're able to solve problems you weren't able to solve before. Or maybe you're able to solve problems in a more efficient way than it was, than you were able to before. Or when you learn a new psychological principle, you're able to change something about your behavior, about your life, so that your life hopefully is better. So all learning reflects in change, change of behavior, change of attitude, change of situation or circumstance, environment. If there are no changes, then you haven't actually learned. Even if you can verbalize what you think you've learned, you haven't actually learned it. And I thought this illustration in, in the inner game of tennis was particularly insightful. So that's self one and self two. And the reason why I have this puppet picture for self one is because self one is kind of, it wants to be in control. It's kind of egotistical. And he gave an example of how self one can uh, use both supposedly positive and negative influences to distract you, distract self two from doing what it is capable of doing. So for example, um, self one is the part of you that criticizes yourself when you do something wrong. So, like let's say you're playing tennis and you make a mistake and then self one is the part of your mind that immediately goes, oh, you made that same mistake again, you're so dumb, that kind of thing. But self one is also, um, it also doesn't do well with compliments. If somebody says something like, wow, you're talented, you're good, you're smart, um, you, you're really great at that tennis backhand or something like that. Self one is the part of your mind that goes, oh, I was just complimented. I have to make sure that I perform well next time, otherwise I'll be bad again or something along those lines. So basically he's saying you have to not allow self one to be in control if you really want to perform at your best. And then he was talking about how self two is the part that it doesn't really talk much, it just observes. And he said, how do you, become a better tennis player is that you want to tap into the power of self too. And how do you do that? It's by watching and visualizing what you want to happen and then allowing it to happen, not telling it to happen because that's what self one does. Self one is always trying to boss people around uh, by people. I mean you, but self two is the one that just observes and imitates. It's like, children, you know, when they're learning how to walk, when they're learning a new language, they're not thinking about, okay, how does this grammar principle work? They're just observing that the people in their lives who talk, talk a certain way. They pronounce words a certain way. They put words together in a certain construction and they, they just kind of absorb it. And then pretty soon those words are coming out of their mouths and they can't really tell you exactly how they did it. They just do it. And so self two, um, it functions on having a good model and then it instinctively knows what to do. And uh, an example of this he said is when if you're practicing tennis because this is a book about tennis but really this can apply to a lot of things we'll talk about that later he says when you're practicing tennis you want to visualize where you want the ball to go but then you don't give yourself a bunch of instructions like okay make sure that you hold the racket a certain way and your feet are a certain stance and you aim that the ball in that direction you just visualize see the ball in your mind's eye going to the destination that you wanted to go to visualize it through the whole you know process bouncing and then going into the the area and then you allow your body to let it happen and just practice that a few times and he said one thing you can do to kind of distract self one and put it out of commission so that self two can do its job is to focus on things like the seams of the ball or the sound that the ball makes when it hits a racket focus on the senses so sight hearing and feeling taste and smell not so much at least in tennis but he's like an example he gave was when he was practicing a particular, I think, serve or something, he noticed that when he did the serve correctly, it made a particular unique sound when his racket connected with the ball. And so he would just like try to replicate that sound, but not very consciously or intention intentionally. He was just kind of like, let's see if we can if we can keep making that sound. And he noticed that every time he kept making that sound, the serve would go correctly. And so I thought that was really interesting. Um, this kind of reminds me a little bit of, I used to have pretty intense training in music, piano specifically, and my teacher would do things like that. She would say, go watch a professional pianist, somebody who's like really good at his game, say Vladimir Horowitz, and then just absorb what he's doing. And then go to the piano and pretend you're him and just like go, just play, see, see what happens. And it really worked. Like when you stop thinking about, okay, I have to hold my fingers like this and I have to sit like that. And um, you're thinking about every little nitty gritty de detail and just kind of like absorbing as a whole, the gestalt of the performance and then trying to replicate it um, instinctively with your own body. 
that's basically what self two does. So that's the that's the crux of what this book is talking about. He talks about how um, if you really want to perform well in tennis, in other sports, in life in general, um, understanding the difference between self one and self two. So self one is the judgy, um, nitpicky attitude, and self two is kind of the like observing, non judgmental, non condemnational. Uh, self. It just wants to see what is and then just kind of adjust to what should be or what probably shouldn't even say the word should, but uh, what it wants, I guess. And he talked about how one of his female students, a, a lady who was also a, a wife, she, after she took this lesson with him for tennis, she was like, oh my goodness, I suddenly understand why I have issues with my relationship with my husband and I have to go tell him something. So she runs off. And then, um, Basically, the idea is uh, all human beings, nobody really likes to be told what to do. The more you are told what to do, the more your people are correcting you and saying, do this, not that. The more you stiffen and, and kind of turn a little resistant. And so when you're doing that to yourself, you stiffen up and get resistant. When you just kind of relax and say, okay, let's observe what's actually happening in real life. What's, what's true? What's reality? And then we'll go from there um, without instantly praising or condemning what you're doing, you're more able to see what actually is and then see what you need to do to get to where you'd like to be. And that's true in multiple domains of life, not just playing tennis. Okay, so let's take a look at some areas that could be better and some writing application or action items. So I, these are obviously my personal opinion. So could be better. I think the length of the book um, was a little on the long side. Granted, this is focused on tennis, so there's a whole chapter in there where he goes into great detail about like the various aspects of tennis, um, volleying and competing and backhands and serves. And for me, I'm not really a tennis player, so I didn't really care about that section. But you know, maybe if you're a tennis player, that would be useful. Although to me, I think it's a little bit ironic that he talks about don't be too detailed nitty-gritty and um, give too many wordy instructions about how you're supposed to do x y and z in tennis just observe what is working and then imitate that and after saying that then he gives this whole chapter about like okay do this do this do that yeah I, I just thought that was probably unnecessary um so that's kind of one into the middle section with all the details on tennis i thought mm, probably this book could have been half the length and twice as powerful in fact sometimes you know books People think books have to be over 100 pages or something to, to count as a book, but do they really? I mean, we're living our world today, you know, things are changing. You don't have to have a book that's over 100 pages. Maybe it's just a 50 page book, but if it has powerful content, that's much more valuable in many ways. People don't have to cut out the fluff. Anyways, all right. And then the last uh, thing on the could be better list is the expand the last chapter on a wider application. I think that last chapter could there could be more to it perhaps, like maybe trade some of the word count from the specific tennis section to the wider application section. I know Galway later went on to write a lot of other inner game of books. There's like the inner game of work, the inner game of skiing or something. So there's a lot of other inner game books, but I don't think that's necessary. I think you could get all the inner game content into one powerful book and that's it. And then not have all these spin-offs. you know, this isn't chicken soup. So um, I thought if he expanded the application in that last chapter, he could, he could do that. But you know, you know, publishers, they want money, right? So they want lots of variations on things. So application items. Um, what did I learn from this book? What are the big takeaways? I thought one thing that was really interesting about the book that it made me think about was he said, why is it that people have such a hard time making their self one quiet down so that their self two can step up to the plate, take charge and help them to perform well and succeed. And he said the reason why is because when people um, let go of their ego and just kind of get into flow and allow their self two to perform, they feel like they're not really in control. So even though they end up performing better, they don't feel like they can take credit for it because self one is more the ego. It's the more conscious side of you. And so so he was like, so a lot of people would rather have that feeling of I succeeded, I get the credit rather than let the I settle down so that the self too, the kind of more subconscious, unconscious side do what it, what it's um, made to do. And this kind of reminded me a lot of the concept of faith, you know, faith in God. Ideally, you know, when you really have faith in God, you let God do the thing. 
you know, you are just kind of the, um, almost like the vessel in a sense. Like he supplies you with the, the energy, the love, the ability to do what it is you, you have to do. And, um, it's not really you. And I think a lot of people have a really hard time with this, including myself. I think we all do by nature. We just, we want to be in control, which means we also want to get the credit for all the good things we do. But the truly good things we do, like the really selfless, loving things that we do, it's, it's not something that we should be credited for. I don't know if that makes sense, but it's like, as soon as you start thinking about, do I get credit for this nice philanthropic thing that I did? Then it's no longer done out of love. You're not really doing it out of selfless giving and love when you're thinking about taking credit for something good that you did, right? So when you let God take the credit and you're just being the one who is lovingly taking care of others or whatever it is that you're doing, um, you don't get credit for it, but you end up being much more effective, being much more loving, being much more giving and caring and having a much more positive impact on other people in the world. But it's hard because we all want to take credit for the things that we do and, you know, the ego, man, it's, it's very, it's very pernicious. We, we like to get in our own way. So that's what that concept reminded me of. Okay. So the second thing, practice a physical endeavor. What I mean by this is I think in this day and age, it's really easy for us, especially people like me, probably like, like you as well, you know, writers, computer people to sit in a room and do computer stuff, you know, digital art or writing, or our, a lot of our jobs are very much, um, tech focused and we don't have a lot of time to, to, hone a skill like tennis, a physical skill that requires you to do something really physical. For me, that used to be um, music, piano. Actually, you know, piano is a lot more like a sport than people realize. But just having something physical to do so that your brain can work in a different way, I think is very helpful. Because going to point three, what's the writing application for this? I think it's really hard to find an exact writing application for the lessons that you learn in the inner game of tennis. Maybe the best thing I can think of is um, if you find somebody that you like as a writer, absorb as much of their writing as you can and just just absorb it and soak it in. Keep your brain turned on though. Don't just skim. Like read it carefully and, and soak in that uh, style and then try to write. But don't don't try to dictate to yourself how you should write. Don't be like, oh, okay, so um, Hemingway, he wrote in very succinct sentences, so I have to make sure that my sentences are really short. Like, mm, that will distract you from saying what it is that you need to say. So I think that's probably the, at this moment, that's the best practical application I can think of for using what you learned from this book in writing. I feel like this book is more of a life application than a writing specific application book. But either way, I, I would recommend this book. I would definitely give it mm, five stars at least, I, I would say. Four to six, five. Uh, let's go with five. Five star book. And if you have never read it before, definitely read it. If you have read it and you've kind of forgotten the whole self one, self two thing, um, <coughs> excuse me. Yeah. If you have read it before and you've forgotten most of the stuff, hopefully this reminded you and feel free to reread it again, I think. This is a book worth rereading every now and then. Mostly, I think the most powerful parts of the book for me were the illustrations that he gave. The two stories of the guy in front of the mirror and the woman who was really bad at tennis, but then he taught her this whole self one, self two thing, and she was able to um, play much better than she used to. Those were the most valuable aspects to the book for me. Sometimes a, a well-told story can teach you a lot more than just a bunch of exposition and prose. So there you have it, Inner Game of Tennis by W. Timothy Galway. So if you are not yet part of our merry band, feel free to join us at beabrilliantwriter.com and also pick up your free checklist and a few other, you know, hidden goodies. Other than that, thank you for listening and I'll see you in the next book chat.